anyway, like a decade later, I would be making a facade of a building um, in Discovery Green. So it's sort of like how something moves forward or how you look back to earlier work. So this is the work that was done at the Austin Convention Center. It's a 40 foot high, um, 400 foot long um, piece of work. We were up on a scaff on, on scissor lifts installing and um, <coughs> After a couple of hours, I was like, what the hell is going on? You know, my feet ache. Why do my feet ache? And um, it was my primal ape brain trying to cling onto the, um, onto the, onto the, uh, but it, it reads a lot like a piece of music. It has a sort of beautiful abstracted um, kind of image. Um, and, and each box, um, the, actually I'll go back, this piece, um, there was a, a drawing, uh, there's a line of the drawing, and I said, what is that? And I said, oh, it's the um, air conditioning vent. And I went, oh, no. So um, I said, could I work with it, and could I change it? So actually, these little inserts are actually air conditioning units, mm -hmm. and the architect, but the architecture of the building is really sort of very male and very sort of grays and browns and, and I really loved putting pink registers in this building because it was, um, but so this sort of really sort of started this whole um, sort of series of uh, two different series. This is called Index for Contemplation and then the more recent is Synchronicity of Color. But, um, and this was done t two or three years ago in um, Indianapolis. Uh, it was a commission for the, uh, the new Wishard Hospital, which is now Eskenazi Health. Mm -hmm. And this is the very first, um, when you come from the garage, this is the very first thing you see. And the colors in this are dichroic colors, which uses sort of nanotechnology where um, as you walk past them, the colors change. And so they have this sort of corporal body. The color is not, you know, I mean, A, it's just this jubilant kind of um, image. For some reason, I mean, it's very dark. I don't know quite sure why it's so dark. But maybe it's dark when, you, you know what, it's my glass. Anyway. Um, but it's this wonderful thing when you walk down, you're just sort of greeted by this, by this, uh, by this piece. And the, the, if any, Eskenazi Health, if any of you have not been, um, it's a great place to just go and look at the art and the building. It's an amazing, amazing thing. And they have done just such an incredible thing of changing how we think of healthcare. Um, I mean, I, I, uh, I, I am my favorite, favorite client of all the world. I mean, they are just spectacular. Um, so again, looking back to these gardens, this is um, uh, an image from Tofukuji, it's the moss garden, and um, in the snow, and then normally what it looks like. And then I sort of took this idea and this image and created this piece called Transformation. And this work is um, a kind of an homage to looking at loss um, and death and the transformation of, that that creates. And in, um, I wanted to sort of replicate the pachinko balls that I was using, but I wanted to sort of reference the snow. And um, in Japan, uh, white is symbolic of death, which is sort of opposite to how we have it. And the black is actually charred wood. So again, so in Japanese architecture, they char the wood, but it's also sort of like the ashes of what somebody would die. And, um, those little ball bearings, as luck would have it, um, are actually slingshot ammunition. Um, so they actually were, they're made to, you know, to kill all the little birds. So in a way, metaphorically, there was even more kind of poignant that this was about loss and death. And um, So I, I travel and travel and travel, I love to travel, and um, I go and see very different things. And um, the image on, the, on your left, right and left, left is uh, from Kerala, um, these uh, temple rituals. And on the right is from um, Burma, maybe Burma or Thailand, I can't remember which. But just this love of like the presence and absence of light. And I created a work, um, there's another presence and absence of light. This is in Japan, this is King Kakoji, which is the uh, golden temple. Um, so in a way, all my travels have kind of, um, they, they, they feed me. So as a contemporary artist, 
I look to probably Mondrian and the sort of early Gestil artists are sort of in my pantheon. Of course, Donald Judd is in my pantheon. And then the ancient um, world is sort of in my pantheon as well. And um, these were a series of pieces that I did for um, Art, Art Pace in San Antonio. And it's called 10 plus one illuminations. And I really wanted to use gold and the sort of luscious, lushness of gold. And um, there are these huge bowls that are about four feet in diameter um, at different heights. And it looks like the f there's a hole in the floor, but yet it's light that's coming down and illuminating them. And there was a woman who came to this who uh, was a priest. And normally at these shows, when you come into a dark room, you're expecting to see a video and maybe some sound. And here it was sort of quiet. And everybody, when they entered, became very hushed and quiet and sort of separated and then sort of stood quietly and just sort of looked in and on to these beautiful bowls that are sort of this kind of bounce back this sort of golden light. And it feels, for me, um, the, the way the light hits you, it's almost like you know, probably everybody, you know, when you, when you fall in love and you, you meet somebody, you meet that love, you feel this like power. And these pieces really kind of, they kind of, they, 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 they bring in a, a, um, an emotion that is, 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 is a corporal emotion, it's a body <coughs> emotion, it's a body responding to a space and a place. Um, so Discovery Green, I was very fortunate to be on the team to design this park in downtown Houston. This was originally all uh, parking lots and they asked two artists to be on the team and um, it was an amazing journey, three year journey. Um, you know, all of us sort of had um, input into this project and this project's probably been the most um, ambitious of my career. Um, and, I'll start, and, and, and I have the most images of it so to show you sort of like the development. Um, so this piece um, knits, and well, I'll go back. Underneath this park is a garage, and I wanted to knit the above space of the park with the garage. And by doing that, um, I convinced the team and, the, and, our, and our, I suppose, funding bodies that they should make sure that, because the the garage and the park was going to be two separate building projects and uh, by knitting the two um, everything was sort of scheduled together and married together and we had a very short building time frame and um, as the artist I think I actually gave the, de you know, the design team the excuse to kind of arm wrestle to, to build this thing together. So there are two objects that are exits to the parking garage. And I wanted to um, create windows of an homage to Ronchon, homage to um, uh, Le Corbusier. And so that was the model. On, the, on your left is the digital model, and on the right is the real thing. And I was just like, oh my god, it's like, you know, it's a real thing. So I was just so excited to actually sort of, from a model to a real thing. Um, and and w this project, how could I um, sh shift my installations to become this project? And one day I was actually looking down at my studio and I went, oh my god, I'll make a floor installation and I'll put it on the wall. I'll lift it and cloak it over the building. And so we worked a lot in, in, um, in Illustrator and did a labyrinth of how to design. If you try and design uh, um, these colors, you can't design them. They have to have these, you know, they can't have logic as to how they come together. It's very much a circuitous route as to how, what piece goes where. And this project, I had a number of, um, this was the power of public art. I, um, hired a ton of my students and most of them have gone on to do become practicing artists and actually the gentleman um, in the middle he just came to visit me at Christmas time he goes you know Margo that that experience working with you has changed my life he said I now can do huge projects in ways that 
I, I only learned from being on your team. It was like, the most amazing experience. <laughs> And um, actually, the woman to the left, she got, he was going to moving to New York. He wanted to get a job. She's, oh, I have a friend who works at the Guggenheim. Let me call her up. And so, like within a week, he had a job at the Guggenheim, and he's now being shipped to do special projects for the, anyway. So around this table, you know, like uh, uh, you know, lots of things have happened. Um, but when I would start with telling people what we were doing, there would be this glazed panic because it was a huge project, and how could you? How could, how could anybody comprehend what to do? And um, the company, uh, the majority of the work was done at the, a metal factory in, um, in outside of Austin. And we had to do precision metal fabrication. Everything was sort of to the nth of, of a degree. And this particular project, I was the third biggest, well, I was the, the top three clients that particular year. And it was um, the U.S. government, Motorola, and I was number three. <laughs> and this project, I hired 136 people. And we, uh, not all solidly, but I mean, it, the economic impact of this particular project, or any art project, is enormous. And, you know, you, you gift, um, you know, a commission, but you also gift uh, an opportunity for a, you know employing young artists or be um, you know training new skills or see um, you know there might you know I, I know like Christo this is definitely the case you know some some uh, I think with the gates the, the the pillar people they were going out of business and you know Christo came along and you know all of a sudden they 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 could you know, still continue to do their work. And so there's a, a just like a, a hidden impact, um, economic impact. So this is some like working drawings, like one queen of boxes here, and it's a labyrinth. Um, I keep changing, we can't get the paint, um, so we have to rearrange. It, it, was a, it, was, it was a labyrinth, it was a very complicated labyrinth. I had to um, retrofit six Penske trucks. This is the site. And it's the garage being built, and you can see that little concrete kind of bunker up on the top. That's the red building, and it sort of gives you an idea of scale. And um, this is before it's being clad. And with this one, um, these were not done properly, and I had to. I said, you know, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. And then uh, the builders was like, oh, little miss, don't worry. And I said, no, 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 no. I'm going to bring my engineer, and we walked through, and the engineer said, yes, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. And they were, oh, yes, sir, yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> but um, you know, learning new skills about you know how to work with engineers, how to work with. Um, you know, getting your books and your financing. Here are all the six Penske trucks, and um, it was it was it was. Uh, we, I have a hundred hours of, of film which I've yet to edit. <laughs> um, I go back to this place, and I really can't. Um, I, I just don't know how we did it. I just don't know. It's like probably I've, I've never given birth, but you know, you forget the um, you know the labor and the pain and the joy and the. Um, you know, the sort of tumultuous uh, repercussions. But it really is a sort of, it, it's sort of like, um, it takes you kind of breath away and it really transforms. The, um, the building on the back is the, um, uh, the George R. Brown Convention Center. And, and, and this park, and particularly these pieces, has really transformed the city. And it really is a kind of a, a beloved um, object. And I made it, I knew that there would be, there were some buildings that you could see from above, but I made it um, knowing that I wanted it to not be something that was just a frontal, but that you would see it from all sides. So, um, you know, the top was just as important as the sides. So, as a, as a sculptor, there are, there are many, many different sort of psychological spaces that we inhabit when we walk through and into and so when we look down onto something is different to if we're being confronted by something which is different than if we can you know look like this is bird's eye view but um and one of my i want to be able to see it on google earth and you can see it on google earth which is very fun 
Um, So uh, one of the things that happened, um, there are all these windows, and everyone was like, Margot, they're going to climb it. And I was like, oh, no, they won't. <laughs> well, this little boy, you know, they look into these windows, because you can't tell what it is. It doesn't, it doesn't speak out as, as a stairwell or a building. It speaks out as, as an enigma. And um, they get their little hands there, and they look through, and then they realize, ooh, well, Maybe I can climb it. So um, it's the big signs do not climb. Um, so I've done. I'm you know true Brit. I love gardens, and I've, I've designed some gardens. So this um, a sort of a, a miniature garden that I that I made, and then I made a much larger one um, for a developer in in okay in Dallas, um, where I designed the pool, the plaza. Um, the roadway. She wanted a monument, and I came in with all these different ideas. And um, then she said, "Well, let's do all of it." And so I worked with the landscape architect, and um, it was a sort of an amazing array. Uh, but you know, when you enter into the beginning of a project, you really don't know quite where it's going to end and go. This is called Sawyer Pool. It's a wading pool. And um, you wade through, and then you can sit into it. It has become, everybody loves this pool. I've seen photographs of like, you know, like 200 people and their kids, like all sitting around this pool. It's kind of a, an amazing magnet. Um, so this is in Dallas. And I think I might close fairly soon for some questions. This is a work called The Cloud of Unknowing. Um, it's from a, a, a text, a sacred text, which has been very, in, 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 I know, Dory knows exactly, it's a very beautiful text. The Zen community has sort of embraced it. Um, and it's really about the, I suppose the, the journey of, of, the, of finding the knowing or the not knowing. And for me, making this piece, I actually made one thin strand in my studio and then went and made all these sheets. And then we made this giant, and then each, this giant piece is made of these tiny little rods and they're put together with um, glass beads. And it really was um, this journey of, of getting lost and um, distracted and weaving and then sort of, when, I, when it came time to finish, I knew exactly when we were going to be finished. And it was a very odd sort of feeling. The pieces are probably about as big as this room, and it's just thousands, of, you know, hundreds of thousands of, it's, 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 I think it was just pretty early on into the computer world, so someone was like, well, these are NURBS, these are sort of mathematical systems that you can build structures in the computer, but it wasn't done in the computer, it was all done through pulling and pushing and, and hanging. And then um, I was, uh, Eskenazi had a, a very big project um, and it was for the facade of a garage and so I decided it was a, a big project, $1.5 million project and I thought, well, I'll just make the cloud of unknowing and make it huge and, but that probably would have cost $3 million to make, not $1.5 million to make, but um, it was kind of fun. But so, so sort of indicating like somehow these, 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 um, uh, these installations, they kind of creep back into the public realm. And um, this is a, another project, um, maybe I'll end here. Um, these are acrylic cubes that are um, uh, sited in a sort of a, a small garden space that I um, was able to um, design. And then they're lit actually from a, an oblique building and they, um, they have all this, different color, this dichroic color. And it's, a, again, a very jubilant, kind of exquisite um, color. Because I now want to keep going. <laughs> <laughs> and so this is a design for a potential piece that was going to be for, the, for Askenazi, but it, um, but it would feel a little bit like uh, the other project. And maybe that's, oh, let me just quickly, I'll show you one more project and then we're through. So this is sort of the design of a piece. This is a project for a private home in, in New Mexico. And this is like a, a little rendering, the architect and um, the client. And then a, a, 
a Photoshop or an Illustrator thing. Amazing, beautiful building. And um, this is the actual finished work. It's this grand house and um, these volumes are the divide to a grand room. And it really is the most amazing project. The, um, the owner just saw one or two boxes and he goes, okay, I'll do it. And I don't think any of us realized how complicated it was going to be. Um, but I worked, we worked on all the fine details of how things should open and close. And um, you actually touch um, surfaces and there are drawers that open and cupboards that open. And then there's a fireplace. And it was very much a functioning uh, project. Uh, my boxes snap on and the, the construction guy, he was very, he was like, who are you people? I mean, you know, because every contractor under the world had built this house. It was a multi-billion dollar house. But they, we were like the, um, the stealth, uh, you know, fine art uh, people. And this is the finished work. And I also was able to do works in the garden. So those are actually cast glass. And this is the casting process um, in my back garden. And made um, these glass works that then are solid glass and then this is me cold working and um, this is sort of sort of setting them in the garden and then this is the finished the finished garden and you know again sort of like the cube the it's it's it, it, it all kind of falls back and in and onto itself so um, maybe we should how are we um. 650. Should I go on? Joyce? Um, what time is it? 650, yeah. Yeah, could you, do you have, if I just do Okay, I'll, I'll so probably go through. So, um, and, and these, what I'm showing you next is sort of like proposals that have never happened, but they're sort of showing you kind of how I propose things. So, this is the Boneyard in Elgin, Texas, where I live, and it's this brick company, it's famous for, in Elgin, and it's, they make glazed colored brick, and I am obsessed with these bricks, and I want to work with these bricks so badly. Um, and I actually bought a building, and inside that building are these pallets of these colored bricks. Um, and then that building that I bought, this historic building, there was a freak, um, tornado and the building was destroyed. I had to mortgage my home to tear down the building and I um, salvaged all the brick and then you'll see later the brick has sort of come back in a um, sort of a, a, a fabulously manifest way. But these are sort of facades, potential facades. Um, this is for a school project in, um, in New York. Um, didn't, didn't get built but it would have been lovely. Um, and then this is a proposal for the University of Houston, didn't get built, but um, using colored glass as these sort of slivers of um, inside architecture. But again, you know, my love of color and what color does to spaces and places. And um, so the, uh, two years ago I had a show um, at the Ulmarf Sculpture Garden and in it were, um, for about 20, 10 years, no, 20 years, I've been working with glass off and on. And um, nobody has really ever seen these works. And so I wanted to share, make a work that sort of was an homage to, um, to the work that I had done in Japan.